Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another episode of Ferris Makes Emulators. This is number 17, which I called Envelopes and Play Control because we're going to be uh, hopefully working on more of this um, Virtual Boy audio stuff. In particular, some stuff that still needs to be implemented before um, yeah, sound emula emulation is at least where I want it to be before leaving this project alone for a while. Uh, by the way, I always uh, I usually end up saying hi to certain people in the chat because they usually say say hi before I actually like between the time where I put up the the stream is starting soon and the time I start streaming, so I usually miss those guys. But hello, Daniel Collin, Osmodi, F Note, um, is that Tomix? It's a new one. Um, Duro two and his other accounts, <laughs> Reshiram, Ernest, Creekpot. How's it going, guys? Good to see you all again, or at least see your names in the chat again. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I streamed already again on um, on Sunday, and I was basically really excited that I started getting audio stuff to work. I made a little bit more progress on Tuesday with something that's pretty cool. Let me show you what that is. The emulator plays audio in real time now. Hopefully you guys can hear that and I have my settings correct. Um, there are some issues with the current implementation, um, but I kind of want to hand wave those away for now and fix them later today. Um, I can go over a little bit how it works though, uh, just because it was a bit easier than I thought actually. So do you see, how's it going? Uh, so basically what I did uh, before I had this, I had this, uh, if we go to the audio driver interface, uh, the only thing I did here was I changed this to append frame instead of output frame, which just kind of made more sense for now. But I'm going to change this interface a little bit because right now it's per sample and I want it to be um, in an actual buffer. F note, by the way, says uh, we can't hear it, but it's a little quiet. Yeah, that, that should be fine. Might turn that up later, but actually I'll just do that now. Hopefully that works. <laughs> um, anyway, uh I used this and then I implemented this with uh, like a wave output audio driver um, in the initial implementation. And all I did is I replaced that with a Rodeo driver. And Rodeo is one of the sort of audio libraries available for Rust. It's built on top of uh, CPAL, which literally stands for Cross Platform Audio Library. Um, hey, Alkama, how's it going? And. Um, yeah, it gives you some basic uh, support for just like playing voices and playing samples and stuff, which is which is pretty nice. The reason I use that rather than CPAL directly is because it has an internal resampler. Uh, so it'll basically just resample all the audio you give it to whatever your um, actual audio endpoints sample rate is, uh, which saves some effort. Uh, the only problem with that is that it seems to only give you... Um, like you, you're able to provide an interface, which is basically just an iterator over samples, and then it will pull the samples one by one from, you know, whatever you give it. Um, that's generally okay, but I'm doing this kind of ring buffer thing, which ends up, I, which basically, long story short, means I'm locking a mutex twice for every sample, which is really bad. Um, it works for now, uh, and then I did some more digging in CPL and also uh, Rodeo. I also uh, landed a tiny pull request on CPL earlier today, so now it also works for i686 Mac, which is literally as easy as, it's, as it might sound, um, or as easy as it could have been. Uh, and so I want to basically use that directly so at least we can uh, only lock this mutex whenever we need to do buffered chunks of audio, uh, which should definitely save, um, yeah, make things a lot faster, a lot more stable. Um, and... Yeah, that should be really cool. I'll probably do that after the stream, actually, today or maybe tomorrow. Because it shouldn't shouldn't take me too long to do that. Um, just didn't have a chance to really do it before the stream. Um, <clears throat> anyway, that's not really the worst thing, just kind of a blemish, so I want to fix that. Uh, that will also change. That's That, uh, again, is why I want to take this audio driver and make it, like, instead of a pen frame where you append a sample by sample, uh, it'll be a different interface where you it'll give you a buffer. Um, or yeah, I'm not really sure how I want it to look at, but I want it to, I want it to give me a buffer and then I can actually feel that with, with different samples so we can make this a lot faster, but I can kind of show you how more of that glue logic works for now because it is, um, it was kind of cool and it changed some top level stuff, but not nearly as much as I was afraid of, which is really nice. Um, so in particular, I guess we can start with this rodeo driver. Um, 
or actually let's not do that <laughs> uh, because basically it's just you know pumping samples into a ring buffer and we can get to that in a second i wanted to talk about the top level stuff uh so i'm in emulator.rs here on the current master i merged all the audio stuff on the master because it works now even though it's monstrously slow which i believe is because of the mutex stuff on some systems on my system it didn't seem to make much of a difference but i'll fix that soon enough uh but basically the only difference is is yeah it creates this audio driver instead of the wave output one here uh you can see here it actually creates it uh this is the sample rate which uh we're going to be output outputting samples at and then this is a number of milliseconds that we'll use for some uh latency because again there's a ring buffer in there um Basically, there's uh, there's the rodeo playback stuff pulling samples off of this out of this ring buffer as we're riding stuff behind the play cursor. Uh, so the length of that buffer ends up being our audio latency, and 100 milliseconds is not terrible for audio. Uh, it's actually quite generous. <laughs> Cry says as underscore is a thing. Did I? Uh, uh, how's it going, by the way? Uh, I had that experience today with. Uh, uh, defining functions in other functions in Rust. I didn't realize you could do that till today. But yeah, as underscore is a thing. So if you, if it knows what type this needs to be, you can just do this, which I really like. <clears throat> so you see, it says, I suppose untyped. No, it's it still uses type inference. Um, it just says, yeah, fill in the type here. Like if this is a U32 and it needs a U size. There are a lot of cases where this doesn't work though. Like if you try to use this in... Uh, in an indexer, it won't work because, yeah, that's an overloadable operator, I guess. Um, yeah, so it creates the, this different audio driver. And then in run, so before it had these different modes where it would either be running and then it would basically have this frame loop uh, where every, you know, 50 times a second it would actually like check all the input and stuff run the emulator for like one frames worth of cycles and then output the video stuff and do and check all the key input. But now we actually drive the emulator based on um, how much audio needs to be produced uh, because the timing ends up being a little more critical that way. Um, so yeah, so basically what I do here now is I figure out, first of all, I have the minimum, uh, minimum auto audio frame surrender. Uh, so basically, um, there's this ring buffer that's just going around and there's a there's a play cursor that is basically reading samples um, from this buffer on another thread. And that's that's where all the lower level stuff is basically pumping that to the driver. Uh, and then what we do is we query that basically every, I want to say frame, but it's not every video frame now. It's like every uh, at least three milliseconds, I believe, because I just sleep three milliseconds here. Um, so we pull the read and write position. So we're reading... Like there's another thread reading from one position and we're going to write stuff behind it, right? Um, so we pull the current read and write position in those in that buffer uh, and we figure out basically how many frames are between there. Um, and in the normal case, which is where the read position is in front of the write position, it's just going to be the read position minus the write position. There is a case where the read position will wrap around at the beginning of the buffer. Uh, so if the read position is less than the write position, we basically assume that that's what happened. Uh, so then we have to take... Um, yeah, tiny bit different math here. Uh, when, when we figure out how many frames we need to render, uh, we then render, you know, as many, uh, we run the emulator for as many CPU cycles as, as it would take for the emulator to generate that number of samples. Uh, bit confusing. Um, but, so we do that and then, um, what was I saying? <laughs> Lost my train of thought there. I was sure to thought because the comments, which are uh, interesting, I'll get to those in a second. <laughs> um, but yeah, we figure out how many uh, frames surrender, but there's there's a lot of cases like if this loop ran really fast for some reason, it shouldn't actually run that fast because of this this sleep here. But we may end up being in a in a situation where where like the the play cursor has only gone like two samples ahead of the, ahead of the right cursor, and we generally don't want to sit there and dump a bunch more or we don't like we don't want to spend time generating like running the emulator more if we're just going to do two samples of audio or something uh, so i have a minimum minimum audio frame surrender as well and we only render if if uh yeah if we need to render more than that um anyway from there it's really simple because we basically just figure out 
um, given how many CPU cycles would happen per frame of audio, and again, a frame of audio is is one left and right sample pair in this case. Um, so that's just the speed of the of the CPU divided by the sample rate. Um, then we figure out the number of cycles to run by multiplying the CPU cycles per audio frame by the amount of audio frames we need to render. Um, and then we run that many, that many cycles. Uh, so you may be thinking, well then, okay, where do we do like checking input and then outputting the video stuff? Uh, so actually that's at the end of this loop. We just see if the emulator had like basically at every one of these steps, we see if the emulator has produced a new frame. If it has, we're going to update the window with it. Um, and then we're also going to, if we're running, we're going to uh, check all of our input stuff. So fairly straightforward. I'm not necessarily 100% happy with how this code fits together, but it ends up being pretty nice. Also for debugging, um, then we just output a bunch of silence here. And this is, I, I can show you why. Uh, basically, when I step into the debugger, let me turn this up a tiny bit. Uh, if I step into the debugger here, like that, um, we don't want it to just keep playing that same, you know, loop of audio for those hundred milliseconds. Uh, the nice thing about this though, is it works, you know, compatible, like it's compatible to just switch between the modes still. So like if we add a breakpoint in the, uh, for the video hardware, you can see we can continue by video frame still. And it, it kind of pops a lot in this case because there's a lot of DC offset in the uh, output audio signal, but this totally works. <laughs> Very clicky. Um, but yeah. So that's pretty cool. Uh, so comments. Uh, Cry says, is there a reason you can't use VecDeck? Is that just basically uh, uh, like ring buffer? <laughs> Other than the fact that it needs to be behind a mutex, but I could use that as the backing store probably. Because I guess then I could see uh, how many samples are in there. There probably isn't a reason I can't. But the reason I didn't is because I didn't know about back deck. Thanks, uh, Jack Skater, for the follow. And again, sorry for the, uh, for the uh, follow notification sound that's just going to happen whenever I have my audio enabled. Helps me actually know when people follow. Um... Pull this over. Vec deck is a growable ring buffer, which can be used uh, as double-ended queue efficiently. Default usage of this type is to use pushback to add to the queue, pop front to remove from the queue, and yeah, just looking at if we can check. Yeah, okay, so we have len as well, so we can see how many things are on there. Yeah, this, this should actually work as well. So I might refactor the interface to use that then. It still needs to be behind the mutex, which is fine. But then then our buffered uh, audio driver interface can just use this probably. If it, like, yeah. <laughs> Give it a mutex guard of, of a vec deck. That would probably work. The reason why I would want a mutex guard in there is if, if we're dealing with mutexes, I kind of want to make that explicit. So it would be nice to, yeah, like have audio driver be able to return a vec deck that we're supposed to populate or that we might populate, I guess, in this case. And then uh, make it a mutex guard of that just to make sure that the consumers of this API know that there's a mutex underneath. So it shouldn't just hang on to that buffer forever. Cries92 says if it needs to be behind a mutex, you could just use uh, some of the non-blocking cues of crossbeam. As long as I can also um, check how many elements are on the queue still, um, as long as that doesn't block as well, then I could probably use that stuff. Because that is that is all I'm doing is I just have this little ring buffer and I just want to you know load it with a bunch of samples. Although, although. Um, I'm just thinking that you might have to like preload the buffer with some sounds, but I guess I could do that. That would be part of the latency. 
because I'm just thinking, um, like in the beginning when you started the emulator, there would be no samples on that queue. You would kind of always need to be a certain thing ahead of it, but you could just like insert 100 milliseconds of silence or something, and then always have it try to stay that far ahead. That should work. I don't see why that wouldn't. But yeah, can probably refactor that. But I, I don't think I'll do that on stream because I don't think it'll be very exciting. <laughs> very exciting change. But And I want to work on envelopes and stuff. Actually work on the sound emulation. But uh, yeah, thanks for the tip. Um, that's cool. And basically this didn't really affect anything else. I had some counter basically would keep track of how many... Um, cycles would happen in the current frame so that it would know like when to output uh, video and stuff. I know I no longer need that stuff because I just, uh, w whenever the emulator produces a video, that's just when we update that stuff. Uh, so that ends up being pretty simple. And then the rest of basically all of this is um, the uh, Rodeo driver implementation. And again, there's not terribly exciting things in here. It, it, it implements this interface. Again, it locks every uh, sample, which sucks, but I'll fix that soon. There's a big note about how much I dislike that. <laughs> uh, but it got us to work initially, so that was valuable. Um, and then it just has stuff like, yeah, actually setting everything up for Rodeo uh, with a reader that reads from that buffer, uh, this ring buffer up here, which literally is more or less what the VEC deck is doing. I know I'm just kind of scrolling through this and just kind of breezing over it, but I just kind of want to show how like small it is. Uh, that it really wasn't that much stuff, and we actually got audio output. Mr. Bandler42 says, "What language do you use?" Uh, Dupe Bang Lang in the channel. Six fifty six says, uh, "You could uh, also possibly use an MPSC as an audio buffer." Yeah, again, as long as as long as I can, like, read where the where the play position is so that I can know when to repopulate that. Cause you don't, you don't want to just keep running the emulator as fast as possible. You want to be able to kind of throttle that so you can reduce CPU usage. Uh, so I think I'm not sure MPSC would, would be appropriate either, but the VEC deck behind a mutex is really not that bad. I'll probably go with that. But I'm, I'm open to uh, more discussion on that, especially if you guys, uh, like if, if you guys have pull requests or want to play with the code yourself. I mean, it all it is all publicly available, so we can talk about different, uh, or we can compare different ways to do it. But I think I'll go with the uh, VEC deck behind the mutex. I don't know if saying behind the mutex is even correct language, but it's just how I see it. <laughs> Fnote says the number of elements would tell you the play cursor position. In the VEC deck, that would be true. In the MPSC, I don't think you can do that. Because, or with the channels, I don't think you can get the number of elements. Um, anyway, that shouldn't be too bad. Uh, basically, another thing, though, is the reason I was able to even use all this stuff is because I, I was under the impression previously that uh, CPL still didn't have... Uh, OSX support yet, uh, which is actually not true and hasn't been true since like this last summer. So they finally, I don't remember who did it, but someone finally went in and did the final glue between Core Audio RS and uh, CPAL. So that totally works. It looks like there's a couple issues in Rodeo though on OSX, but uh, haven't really dug into those yet. Actually, you know what? I do kind of want to fix this now. <laughs> it's, it's just been bugging me. So... Why, why don't I just dig into that now? <laughs> Especially since we're already talking about it. Uh, so I should be able to... Uh, let me... Did I close that window? I think I did. So all I'm going to do is just replace my ring buffer with this. So let's get rid of this. Oh, actually, you know what? No, I won't do this now. And the reason is because then I also need to do a resampler. Um, and I'll, yeah, I'll change that later. I mean, I guess I could still replace this ring buffer with the VEC deck, but that's not that useful unless I change the other interfaces. So I don't want to do that yet. 
Never mind. Sorry. <laughs> I'll do that soon enough, though, because it'll help me sleep at night, <laughs> knowing I'm not locking every sample. Um, okay, so what I want to get into is the rest of the uh, stuff on these voices, because uh, what I got through this last weekend was basically most of the audio stuff, basically all the voices, including the noise voice, but I didn't do the special modulation and sweep on voice 5, which this sound chip has. Um, I'll s probably save that to last, and also for all the voices, the envelope isn't actually doing anything right now. It's just always being at full volume. Um, and then there's some stuff with the play control in how it resets some counters that I haven't actually implemented. Um, and that's what I want to focus on today. In particular, I want to do the envelope stuff first as I think that will make the sort of biggest difference in sound quality. But I have a feeling that play control stuff that I'm concerned about will also kind of have to be solved while doing that. So we'll see. Um, yeah. So in particular, um, I ended up splitting all this stuff up. It's not split up into different modules yet, um, which I tend to just like wait till the last minute to do all the time, which maybe not be my best habit, but it's not too bad. Um, but I did split a bunch of stuff up into different um, different structs here uh, with the different voices. And that was again, because uh, um, like because there's different kinds of voices, it made sense to have these different components that we could build up for the different types of voices. Um, envelope, for example, is one of those. Uh, so in particular, I mean, the, another advantage though, is that like an envelope has a couple different registers and little interface to read those. Uh, so it was kind of nice to also split it up into these little chunks. Um, so the nice thing is like the stuff we'll do today will probably basically be pretty localized other than some message passing between the objects. Uh, but that should be pretty simple. Right now, the envelope does have like read and writes for these registers, uh, but all it does when you ask it for its levels, it just returns full volume here. Um, I did have at one point it would do this, so at least if the envelope was enabled, we'd get uh, some sound and then no sound, but this is not actually correct, so I just want to get rid of all this actually. If we look at some of this documentation here, I want to kind of go over how these envelopes should work. Let me zoom in a bit. Let me know if I need to zoom in more than that. We'll go with that for now. Again, this is the sacred text scroll. This documentation that I keep going through. Um, so this, uh, we're going to go VSU envelope. Uh, the envelope function of sound channels allows their volume to decay over time. It also seems to allow them to increase over time. So um, again, if you missed my last video, um, an envelope is basically just like a function that describes how the volume of a sound will change over time. In particular, if you don't have envelopes on your sounds, they will make these awful clicks when they start and stop. Uh, because of the sudden change in position of your speaker. So you want to always fade sounds in and out. Uh, and an envelope gives you a way to do that. Uh, these envelopes look to be a bit non-standard. In particular, they just look like they have um, some basic counters so that can like ramp up or ramp down linearly, um, which would make it really simple to implement and also fairly powerful because you can make basically most other envelope shapes out of that if you, if you wanted to. Um, but at least now you get uh, like... What's good about it is that the hardware will actually do all the ramps. So if you, you don't have to set like timer interrupts just to manage the envelopes. So it's, it's a pretty good trade-off. Um, in particular, we have a couple different registers for every envelope for all the voices. Um, it looks like there's envelope control, which is whether or not the envelope is enabled. And I'm guessing that will control whether or not like, so I think the envelope has an internal level register, which is like its output volume. I think enable enabling and disabling the envelope will actually not enable or disable the sound, but enable or disable um, the ramping of that internal level register. Um, so that should be pretty, pretty straightforward to implement. Uh, so there's a bit in this register that controls whether or not that's enabled. And there's another bit that controls whether or not that should repeat. And I believe, um, what happens is it will like ramp up or ramp down and it's only four bits wide as far as I can tell. Um, and then whenever it ramps up and then wraps around to zero or ramps down to zero, uh, that will normally turn the envelope off, but I think if this bit is set, then it will actually restart it again. Um, and I'm pretty sure that logic is done on the transition from any number to zero. Um, so that, that could make sense. <clears throat> uh, channel five and noise, noise registers have additional bits not pertin pertinent to the envelope control, in particular the super modulation noise generator. All that really means is that these upper bits that aren't used are actually used on some of those channels, but I've already taken care of that in the memory mapping. Um, and especially in the read and write register functions for those particular voices, those particular voice types, rather. 
Uh, so yes, it says here when uh, repeat envelope is one and the and the envelope reaches zero. So again, I think that's on a non-zero number to zero transition. Uh, the envelope will be reset to its reload value. So I guess we'll get to that in a sec. And it's and the cycle will repeat. When repeat envelope is zero, the envelope will remain at zero once it reaches it. That makes sense. Setting an enable envelope to one will activate the envelope function even while the channel is currently generating sound. So I think that's I think it resets whenever you set that. Uh, Fnote says, has the updated version of the sacred text scroll been made available so you can actually use it? Uh, no, and I don't think it will be for a while because the guy was working on it. He did a lot of stuff in like the audio sections. This is the publicly available version, by the way. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't expect the, his newer one to be available anytime soon. But from what I can tell from looking at it, it doesn't really have... Like it has a lot of corner case details, but I don't think they're going to really matter with how I'm thinking to implement this. <clears throat> so we should be fine with just a public doc. Um, yeah, setting enable envelope to one will activate the envelope function. Even yeah, no, I just went over that. Um, setting this bit to zero will disable the envelope. And again, I think I think enabling and disabling the envelope doesn't like has nothing to do with the actual output level register. I think it's just going to be the ramp. I could be wrong about that, but that's the assumption that I'm going to operate under first. Because uh, there is a separate, in the play control registers, there's separate like enable and disable audio for the voice. So uh, that's why I'm kind of thinking that that'll be that way. Um, and then we have the envelope data register here, uh, where we have these four bits are going to be the reload value. Um, so you'll notice when this like started the envelope, it will load its reload value. Um, and that's like, so when this says activate, I've seen a graph where it actually, like, when you set it to one mid ramp, it will reset to its reload value. So we want to make that the case, I think. Uh, but that's the initial envelope value as well as the value it loads when repeating. When set, the envelope is immediately set to this value. Okay, so maybe it's there and not when it's enabled. Not really sure. Zero represents silence and 15 represents full volume. So it's again a four bit value. Uh, direction specifies the direction which the envelope moves. So we have, yeah, this one bit. It will either decrease over time or increase over time. In both cases, the envelope period ends when the envelope reaches zero. So that's going to, yeah. For growth period, this happens the next step after the value becomes 15. So yeah, that's either going to wrap around from 15 or just drop to zero. Uh, step interval specifies how long each envelope value will last in units of 61.5 hertz, which is around 15.361 milliseconds. Um, add one to this value for the actual duration amount. Uh, so this, again, is just another counter like we had before. Uh, so there's going to be a clock that's going to tick this often, I think. Um, and then when that ticks, we're basically going to ramp the value with, yeah, everything specified here. So it should be should be fairly straightforward. The first thing I'm going to do, actually, is we're just going to model that uh, output volume register, or the level register, I'm going to call it. Um, and we'll just start with that, and then we'll start doing this clock, uh, and then kind of mold this logic into something that actually makes sense over time. <clears throat> Uh, so, yeah. So all we need to do here, um, I'll keep the register stuff at the top, and we'll do level. I like to do these as U size. Um, and here we just return the level. So that's pretty easy. Oh yeah, self dot level. And then this default value is probably okay. So we like that. Yeah, we already have all these at least sitting here, even though we haven't actually done anything with them. Uh, so that's easy enough. Now let's... Actually, I think I will do some of this logic first before reaching the clock, because I think, I think that'll make sense. We'll do a... Um, make a little cycle callback for this, though, anyway. Just like we have with the uh, voices. But that won't do anything yet. That'll just do the counting stuff and some other things. And we also might uh, change this counter so that it's um, the counter for the cycle here actually is in the VSU itself. Might might do that with the uh, um, some of the voice stuff as well, because at least the the first clock divider doesn't need to happen per voice or per whatever. Although it's not going to be that bad. 
in terms just because there's so few of these running at any given time. Um, yeah, so we wanted to, first of all, if you set this uh, reload value, basically whenever you write this, because it's said here, reload value is the initial envelope value. Um, when set, the envelope is immediately set to this value. So basically anytime this register is written, we're gonna wanna do that. Um, so that's, we'll just do that here. So there's that simple logic. Um, yeah. We have the direction, little period. A lot of implementing this stuff is just sitting here reading this text over and over again and just writing like one line at a time. Cause you just kind of have to, like for me, it's at least hard, especially when I'm talking on the stream to keep a lot of this in my head at one point. Uh, but it's easy to just like write a little bit and then check if that's logically consistent and then go back and forth and do that. Bit slow, but doesn't end up being too bad. So we're not worried about the repeat stuff. And we're not terribly worried about the enable or disable either. I think think what I'll do is is because this register already has this enable bit, we'll use that as our actual state. Um and then when, when we reach zero and repeat is not set, then we'll just disable that that bit there, that Boolean. Yeah. Okay, so I think that's actually all we need to do for this first round, and then next I'll do that clock. Uh, so that'll be really easy. We're basically going to we want a counter that'll count to this. Uh, so if we go up and look at the other counters that are already here, um, I'm actually gonna put it over this just because of the order things are in the code right now. Um, we're just gonna do a constant envelope clock period in nanoseconds. Again, everything, like to keep everything in the most round numbers, we should have just like, I could probably just do everything in, um, like CPU clock ticks, like units of CPU clock ticks. Uh, but keeping it in nanoseconds just keeps it a lot easier in my head, or a lot simpler in my head at least. Because the 50 is kind of a hard number for me to visualize, <laughs> but one is not. Um, so here I just took like the amount of um, nanoseconds in a second divided by some period. Um, in this case, if this is 61.5 or 65.1 Hertz, I don't like that this is such a low number. And I also have a feeling that this, um, so I, I always like to do like kind of a little bit of math whenever I look at clock rates, especially because a lot of documentation will tend to just kind of round this to a number that makes sense. Because you're generally not like, you don't care if there's five extra digits here. You only care about when this happens. Um, but usually this is going to be like an even number, like you're going to divide the input, um, clock, like in this case, the 20 megahertz clock that goes to the sound unit by some number and you'll get this rate. Um, so it makes sense. So let me, so I'm a little slow today, guys. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so this is how many nanoseconds there are in a second. And if we... I also could just take this 15 whatever milliseconds divided by that, but we'll we'll do this for the exercise, 65.1. We should get around 15, 361. 36, yeah, which is exactly what we get here. So that's basically what we're going to do. And I'm thinking what I'll do is if this is about... Hmm... Actually, if we know that it's exactly this period in milliseconds, what we might as well just trying to think. We might just as well encode this in nanoseconds. Oh. 
or is this 15 milliseconds? This is already in nanoseconds, actually. <laughs> Should be, at least. Yeah, because millis, micros, nanos. So that actually should work. I'm actually just going to basically copy this for now. Before I did the math to figure it out, but we can do that'll be good enough for now. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're just going to actually have some values to do this counting. I believe just to keep with some naming here, I use these names. So the other the other reason why it would actually be better to use um, units of the the clock tick is because we would always get like the exact values here. Like this is kind of a crazy value in nanoseconds, but it'll be kind of approximate. And it'll be good enough for what we need. Uh, but it should actually be like an even number that we're dividing by. And I had a note about that in the sample rate as well, that like the actual sample rate should actually be a little bit different. Although this presents some problems um, with uh, actually outputting in that sample rate. But since we're doing a resampler, we could probably fix that anyway. Um, just some thoughts. This will be definitely, this the, these counters and everything will definitely be close enough for what we need. Um Kind of stupid to have the word envelope here, but it's going to be fine. Envelope indestruct called envelope. That'll be fine. Uh, and then the logic to do this is very, very simple as well. Let's copy this again. Just being lazy. Yep, and then we'll do, yeah, we'll come back to this in a sec. And we want to make, actually make sure that this is called, which is, should be really easy. So we can do should be just that. Pretty nice. No errors. Except this field that's never used, which is fine. So we're going to do this. Right in C sharp all day, so I keep forgetting to do self. Uh, so what this is going to do is we have we want to compare this counter to uh, is it the step interval? I think it was. No, totally was not. <laughs> oh no, it totally is. Never mind. Just seems like there's not very many bits for this. But I guess you wouldn't need that many. This is a pretty. Okay, let's just try that. Uh, so if this is. We'll do greater than or equal to because it will always do one tick here. Uh, Loli Sir TV says, is that the Rust language server stuff? Nope. This is a uh, racer, I believe. Although I could be wrong about that. I'm not actually that familiar with what's with uh, the integration and supply. But I don't think it's the Rust server stuff yet. At least I haven't updated this package in a while. And it'll probably take them a while to incorporate that. Plus the Rust server stuff is beta, so they, or alpha even, so they probably won't do that for a while. Um, yeah. I'm wondering, because if envelope counter were, I think we actually want to do greater than here. Because then we'll get the effect of always having this value plus one iterations with this counter. Or the uh, the uh, step interval plus one iterations. So for example, if there's one in there, it should actually be two of these counters. So plus one will be one. Plus, yeah, so we, we want greater than here. Um, 
So we'll do self dot break data step interval. We'll do self dot envelope counter is where we set that. And then we want to do our repeat stuff here. Or our um yeah, our actual tick here. Uh, so this is where things will start getting a little more interesting. What I want to do here. Basically, just check if the envelope is enabled, I guess. Then we want to actually adjust the envelope value. That should be pretty easy. So we do it depending on direction. We'll do Um, self dot data direction. This is a boolean. So if it's if it's one, we're going to increase. Otherwise, we're going to decrease it. And we actually want this to wrap around, so we'll do. Wrapping sub one. And then what we'll do is we'll uh, zero F. Mask out those last four bits. So that'll give us the new level. And then we say if self level is zero, so we adjusted the, the level and now it's zero, uh, then we want to check if it's repeating. If it is repeating, we'll do self dot level is um, the reload value, and I think that's all that ends up doing. And the cycle will just repeat if that happens. So that makes sense. Otherwise, we're going to let level still be zero. And we'll disable the envelope. And my gut feeling is that this will work. That this is actually all the envelope will do. Especially when you end up with really simple logic like this. That's That generally tends to be a pretty good indicator. Especially with like cheap hardware like this. Uh, that That's more or less correct. By the way, I did, I did more research. And, and one of the things that always kind of puzzled me about this system. Is, is how primitive the hardware seemed for the time it came out. But I, there ended up being an article. Let me let me dig this up because this was this was a fascinating article actually, about just like weird hardware at the time. Um, oh, where was it? It's a really really cool article about the history of the Virtual Boy. I can't remember who wrote it, so I just gotta find it. Ah, oh, here it was. It's called "Unraveling the Enigma of Nintendo's Virtual Boy 20 Years Later." I'll paste that in the chat really really cool article and it talks about how basically this thing was actually meant to be like a head tracking device and like a proper vr machine uh, but around that time at least in japan uh, there was some legislation passed that made companies um, actually start printing warning labels for like everything uh, which is one of their also one of the reasons why there's so many warning labels on this apparently that was also um fanaticized by the japanese media a little bit or not fanaticized what's the word um uh, I can't remember the word. Well, they just blow it out of proportion. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why a lot of, like, this didn't sell really well. Because it was just totally, yeah, like, it wasn't as dangerous as people uh, assumed it was seeing all the warning labels. Because they had never seen that many warning labels on a toy before. But it was just because they had to actually start doing that legally. Um, but yeah, uh, at the same time, one of the reasons why they put it on the stand. Like, I, I assumed that it was because of the oscillating mirrors. Uh, but it's actually because, like... With a head tracking device, they had all these like horror stories when their lawyers were going through everything. Like, what if a kid is is sitting there, you know, using this thing and running around the house and falls down the stairs? Um, just like awful stuff like that. Uh, so they ended up making it, you know, something that would sit on a table. Um, but 
the thing is that like a lot of things kind of fall into place when you think of it like that because if it's going to be a head tracking display like that they they meant for it to be like a really portable unit which is why it has basically beefed up Game Boy hardware to do 3D. Um, a lot of other interesting things. The article goes into a lot of this stuff and also the history of like how the scanners were developed um, and who developed them. Uh, so I recommend you guys reading that if you're interested in you know crazy old hardware stories because it's really fascinating. Um, but yeah, I just found that interesting. Um, and that's related to this, of course, because of just how cheap this hardware is. Move away, double zero. How's it going? Thanks for the um, the uh, auto host, by the way. Appreciate that. So this should just sound better now. <laughs> Studio C, thanks for the follow. Let me turn this up. This sounds better, but it sounds wrong to me. Maybe not though. Maybe it's just how quiet some of those sounds are. Oh, that actually sounds great. The bass has a proper ramp now. If I turn up the audio, by the way, too much on this, let me know. Oh, we got the sample. We got the vocal sample. Oh, hold on. Okay, someone someone said the game output's really low. Cuz it it is actually. Like it's the system doesn't output very loud sound. Let me play this again, because I, I wasn't sure if, if this was actually correct. But so, th so there's a vocal sample in here, and I guess it's now, now I know it's done using the envelope control, which actually totally makes sense, because you can set the exact level of the volume. Oh, this actually totally makes sense, because if you guys remember, I had the wave dump of this, and it was just like a DC offset where it was supposed to be the sample. But it totally makes sense now that it's done by using the volume control, because if you have some DC offset, you can just level that if you have a timer that's going often enough. And you, like you can't, with this hardware, it'll lock you out. Like you can't write the waveform stuff, the waveform, um, uh, sorry, I am slow today. <laughs> you can't write the any of the waveform memory or any of the like modulation memory while voices are playing. So it totally makes sense that they would do that with the, with the envelope, but I did not expect to hear that just now. Here you can hear the bass is a lot stabbier. Also, this is the cheesiest vocal sample ever when it comes in, but it's just so satisfying to hear that. To Snake's world. Let's go. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Two C says, I was already subscribed by the way, just misclicked when switching to tablet. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> Still cool. But you can also hear in that vocal sample, it's a bit slow. And I wonder if that's, it could actually, I don't think it's the timer because like it had the right duration. It was just a little too slow. It might actually be that adjusted sample rate. So that's interesting. Okay, so that's not correct. <laughs> Getting closer though, right? F note says it could be that it was that slow in the actual game. Nope. <laughs> As on the case, as you can see, I have three virtual boys behind me. Um, and I definitely know that that vocal sample is not that slow. <laughs> I about, I ended up getting a couple extra units uh, for like parts and repair. One of them has uh, scan lines on the display and I totally know how to fix that. The other one um, uh, just doesn't work at all. And I need to look into that, but I think I'm going to tear it up uh, and make... Uh, one thing I want to make is a USB controller adapter, so I'm going to make that out of parts from that second one. And then, yeah, take whatever spares I can from there. Taking, like, the cartridge slot hardware as well would be really nice. Um, just want to test some other games here that I... You can hear those those clicks when it just repeats the audio buffer when I move around the window. Because that also sounded a bit slow to me.
Generally, this sounds a lot better, though. But some of the noise stuff in particular still sounds a bit strong. Oh, oh we missed some background sounds there. Percussion here sounds way better. some other ones. Wait, double zero is a bit staticky, yeah. Definitely. I think like I think it is actually supposed to be that noisy, but I think it's just too like the envelopes aren't working on it correctly, so it it ends up being way too prominent. I think. Could be wrong, but that's that's my gut feeling. But that sounds way better. Oh, that sounded way better too with the, the plane now, because now it fades in and out. That was pretty cool. Like, it's actually a little bit disturbing. If some of this works as well as it does, and then the rest of it doesn't. Wait, double zero says uh, too many special chars in those ROM files. I don't really mind. <laughs> I'll comment. It's so cool. Thanks, man. I'm really happy about this. <laughs> but this was a bit wrong. <laughs> Not really sure why. Let me uh, let me again find a case where that was very obvious. In particular. I'm a bit unsure about this one. Like, I don't know if this is actually a clock divider or something that will actually use to increase or decrease the uh, the value here. Something like that could actually make uh, make the errors we just heard make sense. Just gonna check one thing really quick. <laughs> Let's all watch Ferris scroll through something off screen. Sounds like my idea of a good Thursday night. Ah, you know what? You know what? I actually think this might be correct. Yeah. First of all, we observe a Thursday mid afternoon for me. Well, that's not too bad. <laughs> uh, but I actually think that that what we heard might be correct, and let me tell you why. Because there's something in the play control that totally that I totally forgot about for this. Um. So the play control has something called duration. Um, and so used, yeah, the duration is how long the channel should generate sound before automatically shutting itself off in units of this many hertz. Um, if you had one of this value, uh, you get the actual duration specifier. So there's another like duration counter for the note where if you enable the sound, uh, enable the sound for that channel, it will play for a certain amount of time and then just shut itself off if this bit is set. So actually it could be that the envelopes are fine, but then this isn't implemented. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna commit what we have here. Um, oops. 
I have some extra changes here just because like I have the emulator blown up a bit and stuff. Let's do this. Nope, 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 nope. Yes, please. Take these. And yeah, I'm guessing that this actually, like all the prominent noise stuff as well, this would totally make sense if that were the case. Uh, just because they would play for too long. Like they might actually need to be that loud, but then just uh, play for too long, which would make us hear them more. <laughs> um, so if we do the 260.4 hertz here, we can basically do, uh, where's, is it over here that'll give you that? I just need to copy that value again. We're going to make another one of these counters here. In particular, the play control ends up being before that, so we'll put that up here. I'm going to basically do the same thing here. 264 hertz. Whoops. Stop. Stop. I'm not good at this calculator. Uh, what's that again? 260.4. We'll just copy this value again. Might even want to round this one up. Let's do that. Uh, yes, yeah, so we'll do that, and then we'll use the same counter pattern here. So probably, like, could make this its own little counter struct, but honestly, it's just so simple. This pattern that just keep doing this, and and probably I'll consolidate a lot of these clocks, all these different counters for clocks into just the VSU later. So. This will be fine for now. The duration counter bit is a bit interesting though. So in particular, what we want to do, uh, this will activate the sound, begin generating sound. Uh, setting use duration to one will cause the channel to automatically deactivate after the specified duration has elapsed. So what I'm going to, what I'm going to do is when we write this, I'll say if self.useDuration. We're going to do self.duration counter is zero. Uh, and then here we also need another cycle function. And we'll do the same counter stuff that we did before. This totally worked. But we're only going to run this. And I have this cycle tick here. Um, if use duration is actually enabled. Actually, you know what we'll do? We'll always tick this just in case. And the reason is that we won't get drift between the different clocks in these different voices. Because I'm, I'd be willing to bet that these, these clock dividers in the real hardware, there would just be one of them for all the voices. So they'd all be on the same clock. And this would kind of give us that same thing may not be that clear in the code as it is now that that's what's going on here, but I think this ma this makes sense. Um, that'll be duration. And this this part will do if self.use duration. And we also want this to be, if it's enabled and use duration, then we're going to update this counter. Um, and if that gets to the duration, then we'll do self dot enables false. And it might actually be that easy, except actually dispatching that cycle thing there. Ah, you know what else I totally didn't do? I totally didn't uh, update the envelope for the noise channel, which 
<laughs> also makes sense. <laughs> Good job, Jake. Um, yeah. Kind of is not a very good name that we call this register play control because you wouldn't really, yeah, have cycles for register. But we're going to leave that for now. A lot of this stuff, I just like to make work first and then fix the, uh, fix the naming. Okay, so with both of these, stuff should actually make sense. That should be fine. Except the output here. No, wait, because the play control, everything's mixed with the play control later down here. If they enable down here. Yeah. Okay, so this should actually fix everything, I think. <clears throat> I usually use this Galactic Pinball song just because I really like it. By the way, I'm going to uh, the VIP stuff that I have locally. I'm just going to get rid of that. How are you guys liking this uh, regular stream time, by the way? Because I'm really enjoying it. Super easy to just commit to doing it one day a week and then plan around it. Still sounds good. Again, this part's really quiet. And it gets louder. Gizmo in Studio C says it's good. Awesome. Happy to hear it. Topics says future is here. At least for TV, it's good. Cool. This is sounding really good to me. Welcome to Snake's World. Let's go. Did you see that bass? Yeah. It's when like the cymbals kick in in this part in particular. <clears throat> Way double zero says, I just wish I didn't have a meeting scheduled for the beginning. Yeah, that's a bit unfortunate. A comment says, This is great, still an hour before it collides with Mystery Demo Scene Theater 9000. FNOS says, Was the sample more like what you expected this time? No, because we didn't adjust the rate at which things are playing, we're just adjusting like the envelopes. And at least this part sounds a lot more like I think it should. Although I think, I think at some point, I think Planet VB has some recordings of some of these sounds. I might check against those, just because at least that'll be easy to pull up. I should check against the real hardware, but that's going to be harder to get on stream. Or, well, it's harder to get on the stream unless I unplug my voice mic, and I don't want to do that. This this sounded more sensible, at least, so far. Welcome to Snake's World. Let's go. That sample's ridiculous. Ah, ah, no. Oh, that's disturbing. So, hmm. <laughs> Before I just like start trying to debug this, I want to actually see if I can just like visually figure out what might be going on. If we can kind of identify any problems that way. So, okay. So a really obvious place where this happens then, just as a mental note, is if we skip through the menus in this game. <laughs> get past it. Here. Nasty static. 
So it sounds. Let me let me actually go and find those uh, those things. Anonymous, thanks for the follow. <laughs> I don't know if that's actually someone named Anonymous or if that just happens. If there's a setting for that. Um, yeah, so I'm on planet uh, VB. And somewhere down here, oops, actually it's up here. I think I have games here. We want to go to Galactic Pinball. Multimedia, I think. They've got like screenshots and stuff, photos of it on the hardware. Really cool. Audio. Here we go. From OST Rip. I'm pretty sure this actually comes from another emulator, but it's going to be, again, better than trying to hook up the actual system for now. And I can check the two later. But we really just want... Actually, I don't know which one this is, so I'm just going to do the whole album. Stromberg1, thanks for the follow. Really appreciate it, guys. Um, yeah, I should have done this before the stream. Ah, oh, it's only going to take a couple minutes. Then that'll be good. Thing is, I don't really know what the songs are called, so I can't just grab one. I guess I could, like, just try a bunch of these. Actually, in particular, if, if, do we have, like, the ambience here? Here we can, there's a sound fading in and out that's, like, stepping. Then just earlier, that sounds right. Also sounds like there's some modulation and sweep stuff on that, so it makes a little kick drum. Again, we haven't done that, so that's going to be wrong, but that's fine. <laughs> that's how you talk in space. <laughs> awesome. This part sounds about right. Except, oh, you can just hear it. Really subtle. Ready? Oh, didn't have it that time. Um, that snare, does that sound like, like hers? Can be a lot of just comparing back and forth today, <laughs> but that's, that's what we gotta do. That is way too slow. At least this is a cool song, right? <laughs> Hi-hats, though, in this one, you can hear just tick and then shut off. Whereas in mine, they would kind of just keep playing, like, silent, like, quietly in the background. If that was wrong. If I had to guess, I'd say that's that's the envelopes doing that. Fno says, I think the snare is a bit wrong, too. Are you able to describe what about it you think is particularly wrong? Because I, I think that actually sounded pretty on point. At least with the color of the noise sounded right to me. But maybe the volume ramp was wrong. I might have just been not listening for that as much that time. Even though I should have been because that's what we're working on. I think the envelope clock is going to be correct at least. Because I think there's that sound that fades in and out at the beginning. Um, that kind of like steps in volume, and I think that that was the envelope doing that, so I think this is probably correct.
If not, it says fixing the heights will probably fix the snare too. Yeah, I'm thinking so. Thinking so as well. So I just want to check little things here first, like, like let's let's go back, go back and forth between these. The reason I want to do that is so I can kind of let a little bit leave my head and then come back to it and see if there's any um, any anything we might have missed that might be obvious. <clears throat> uh, so here, yeah, repeat envelope is set to one. The envelope will reset to its original value. And the cycle will repeat. Oh, it's just going to disable. I think that's still correct. One will activate the envelope function even when the function is currently generating sound. Okay, this might be relevant. Oh no, that was just this. Or I th maybe that only happens when the envelope is enabled. Oh no, that's the data reg. So that, that actually should be right. But then the control reg... Hmm. note says, have you considered adding save states at some point? I'm wondering if they'd be useful for debugging. On one hand, uh, you've already written and debugged most of the emulator anyway. Uh, I can tell you one 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 way they would be really useful is like right now, if we if we listen, to, we have to listen through a bunch of that song. If we had a save state, we could just load up the save state. I mean that that save state might contain some like invalid register values. Or not, not really, like, they wouldn't be far off, and it would, I think it would correct itself reasonably, but, yeah, that could be helpful. I don't, I don't think we'll need it for this, though, because, as you say, like, we're already kind of late in that cycle, so I'm not sure that'd be that important for debugging. But I would like to, at some point, make this emulator, like, really good in terms of having a lot of those kind of features and, and a decent GUI for that, for that stuff, and, um, but uh, in the next couple of weeks, for me, at least, I want to kind of wrap this up to the point where I can shelve it for a while. Although I kind of want to like enumerate all the things that I'm thinking about for it and see if other people are interested in filling in a lot of those features. Um, because that's the kind of thing that I'd be really like happy to kind of foster a little community around if people are interested. And after the, after the core emulation is sort of done, there's still like some bug hunting and fixing that needs to be done. So I think there will still be relatively interesting work if people want to want to do that. But I just want to get it emulated enough so that I can leave it out of my head for a while just because I have some other projects to work on that are going to be time sensitive in, in, the, in the next couple weeks or in the next couple months rather um, so this this will activate the envelope function I wonder if that means it'll reset the envelope I mean that's the envelope enable uh, that, that is here hmm I wonder. The reload will always reset the value, so we've done that. And I'm guessing that just setting this to zero like the volume to zero will not stop the will not stop the envelope, um, so I'm pretty sure like this logic, um, where it's going to wrap and everything, I'm pretty sure that needs to happen here. Um, after the level adjustment, because like it would make sense if you set the register level to zero and then enable the envelope to ramp up from zero. So that's kind of what I'm thinking there. Did I have the direction correct? Looks like it. Uh, 
wonder if I did the mapping correct. Might have just gotten some bits wrong. Is that correct for bit three? Zero, one, two, three? Yeah, that should be correct. The step interval is bits two to zero, which should be those last three bits, so seven should be correct here. This should be correct. Hmm, actually. The counter. Might want to reset this here. That could make sense. I don't know if that, like that should make sounds last longer though. But it, it could make sense. That should be more correct anyway, because it'll change how, like, basically when this stuff triggers. And that should make sense. Also, we probably don't want to do this counter unless the envelope is enabled. So I think that makes more sense. Let's just try that. I don't think that'll fix the problems, but I think that's more logically sound. There's always going to be a pop when the sound starts and stops from the emulator, just because, again, there's a big DC offset. I guess, actually, if, if there's post filters, which is another thing that I want to do eventually, um, to sort of model the analog circuitry after the sound, or after the digital components of the sound generation, um, that would actually, should actually fix that DC offset pop. Because it should fix the DC offset. Welcome to Snake's World. Let's go. Yeah, it didn't help. <laughs> um, that does make more sense to me, though. By the way, did I... Um, I don't think I pushed the duration stuff, and I want to do that really quick. Just before we keep digging in here. Envelope counter? Oh, yeah, that was just the thing we just did. Do want to do this one? that just keep everything in more separate commits um hmm. this should be the four bit value there so again i'm just looking for obvious things because i i could sit here and start like printing out all the register rights again um but that's going to take some time and it's going to be i think a bit hard to read and sort of decipher um like ideally i think the best way to debug this would actually be to have an interface to like like mute and solo voices i actually did this when i ported my uh snes audio unit emulator to rust i'll pull up a screenshot of that just to show you kind of what that looks like or what i think that could look like uh i don't remember which repo this is on Here we go. Uh, so th this was, uh, I can't remember what I was having issues with, but it was like, especially uh, one of the things I did after doing this, but I think this was for debugging some like problem with the envelopes or something. But when uh, later I, in I implemented more accurate resampling for the waveforms in that DSP, 
and this this interface was just really useful to see what was going on. So you could kind of mute and solo voices and get different outputs of different voices, uh, like in little sample windows. And also the output of the whole thing. You can see the color split because these are left and right. Like this is, you'll see a little bit of color split there, but it's a bit harder to see. Something like this would really help here, I think. Also seeing the register values, which this didn't even have. Um, but developing that takes uh, an evening or two of work, like coding really hard. So don't think I want to necessarily do that. Uh, sorry, Tomix, I have uh, um, links disabled. <clears throat> um, but so I, th so I think we'll just be able to sort of hopefully see stuff over time, just looking at the, listening to this stuff. One thing I think I'll do now, though, is I want to isolate that noise voice in terms of the output mixing. Uh, just because I know, like, we know that that's where something's going wrong. So let's kind of isolate it and see if we can listen to that. Uh, should just be that. Tomic says, I posted this to our watch people code. Yeah, thanks, man. I'll post the, I usually post the YouTube video to there afterwards, at least. But posting, uh, posting this link there is pretty good too. The live link. So I appreciate that. Okay, so we should basically not hear a lot until that noise is supposed to kick in, uh, which will probably happen. <laughs> that sounds not incorrect. This is just like solid noise. That's got to be wrong. Like, this sounds like it's not even ramping. Comments this instant bingo on the voice, lucky guy. <laughs> That's funny. You know, I almost wonder if it's not dispatching stuff correctly. If note, uh, so this is the automatic turn off delay separate from the envelope. I think it is. It's it's controlled by separate registers. One of them controls if the voice is on or off, and the other one is just like the volume ramp. So I'm pretty sure those are supposed to be separate. Osmodice says, and here I am trying to debug locking issues in my kernel. Yeah, this, this is a bit lighter weight, I think. <laughs> Surveyor else says, are you running the code you believe you're running? Printf. Uh, Println, I believe, in Rust. <laughs> um, shift. Oh, yeah, that's that shouldn't be important here. Osmanai, what has your code done for you lately? It's played some almost correct music. That's about it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's the noise generation. I think this is correct. I'm going to double check on these registers, actually, just to be sure here. Ratchet 2497, how's it going? Because there's the... I think it's later here and does the noise stuff. Yeah, so the envelope and the noise control are using the same bits. In particular, this just uses the these two bits here. And 
the control where I go and uses those last couple bits. Should be fine there. Dan Hollick, how's it going, man? This is BS. I've been watching for five minutes and there have been zero puns. Sad. <laughs> so unlike me, right? Ratchet, I'm doing pretty good. We'll be doing better when this works. <laughs> and here, the sweep and modulation also works with this. Uh, uh, maybe actually that's stone register. I thought some of these overlapped. Ah, it's here. At the yeah, the envelope control will just reuse some of the sweeping and the noise generator stuff. So that should be covered here as much as it could be. Oh, Slack. I'll close that. Close Discord as well. Yeah. Just want to check these bits as well. This is correct now because we're not actually running that at the moment. That'll be the standard voice. This is the envelope control. And we had enable on bit zero and repeat on bit one, which is correct here. And we already checked this. When set, this immediately goes here. That's correct. And I also reset the, this counter here. Robuck, Robuck. I'll try to say that. Thanks for the follow. I'll comment, hum, what happened to, what about that big file with addresses, maybe voice six concert mistyped? That's actually totally possible. Uh, that's the memory map here. Let's go ahead and check that out. I don't think these are incorrect. Um, I think I've checked those a few times, but let's definitely double check those. The voice six is the same as the noise channel here. So it'd be five, four, zero for play control. Yep. We're good there. Five, four, four for volume. Frequency low and high is eight and C. You'll notice there's also a one here, but that's because I masked that out before um, mapping again internally inside this uh, unit. That's the offset of all the registers for the sound unit. Uh, for envelope data, five, five, zero. And noise con noise channel envelope noise control five five four, so it looks like those are correct. Uh, also, while we're at it, we'll double check that that's actually being dispatched correctly down here. Uh, so voice six play control goes to voice six read play control. Voice six volume goes to volume, low to low, high to high, data to data. Noise control goes to uh, envelope and noise control reg, and then we'll do the same here. Play control to play control, volume to volume, frequency low, high to high. Yeah, this looks correct to me. Unfortunately. The puns will increase when the bugs decrease. FNUT says, I'm guessing my Ferris Boy name suggested came in too late for it to be worth switching from Rustful Boy. I like Ferris Boy. I just think I like Rustful Boy a little better for the name of this project. <laughs> but it was carefully considered. <laughs> Easily top three name suggestions. Of the three or so that I got. Um... Yeah, this all still looks correct here. Ratchet, what about just Ferrum? I think I'll stick with Rustro Boy for now. I don't think it's anything with the actual noise generation itself. 
That wouldn't make too much sense. Can double check the mixing though. This actually reads. Yeah, this will only actually mix stuff if the volume is enabled here. And it will use the level of the envelope. As far as I know, this math is all correct. We double checked that last time. And I also added a couple other shifts somewhere to the output earlier in the week. Uh, just thinking about like realizing that even if all these values are saturated, we actually never overflow. So I think I added another shift to the output volume to make it twice as loud without worrying about it. If not, uh, yeah, thanks for posting the repo link there. Or, yeah, making Nightbot post repo link. Feel free to check along, guys, if, you, if you'd like. But I'm not really sure. And I, so I don't think it's that, and I don't think it's the, yeah, the mixing here. This is where I added another shift, did some other bit masking here. I also did a offset, um, yeah, because, like, w when you shift this three times, then we actually go over the, yeah, over our I-16s, like, half volume. <laughs> I'm not explaining that very well. Again, I'm a little slow today, but we'll figure it out. So we're still dispatching all the cycle stuff, which is what we need to do. Um... It's just so weird that that voice just keeps playing like that. The only thing that I could think that might cause that to happen is if the envelope were not enabled and yet still had a certain value. Maybe that actually makes sense. Maybe if the envelope is disabled, the envelope's value is zero. Or the, the level ends up being zero. That doesn't seem right to me. It feels like that is supposed to be separate. But let's just try that and see what happens. Easy way to do it would be to just check here. But I think it's more correct to do that here. I, I guess what I don't like about that is that like this sets the level here, even though it's separate from the control. So I guess actually the only correct place is to do it here. Uh, let's do zero. Let, let's try that. Before this, this actually didn't work, I remember, before I actually implemented the envelope, but that might have just been because, like, sounds are supposed to ramp up and then I didn't have the ramp. So maybe this logic is correct. Let's try. Because that, that could also make sense, though. That if the envelope is disabled, you wouldn't get any sound. So we're just listening for noise. We should hear the sound here. Yeah, see, there it didn't play the sound there, so I actually don't think that's correct. Just out of curiosity, yeah, see, now we're basically getting nothing. And so I don't I don't think that's correct. I think something else has to affect the level here. Get reload here and we reset this counter. That looks good. Adjust level here. And either way we adjust, we always take only those four bits. So that should make sense. Level is zero. And we repeat, then we just continue on. Otherwise, we'll just disable the envelope. Hmm. This is looking correct to me. Maybe we didn't do the play control stuff correctly here. Am I doing the use duration thing correctly? 
So I'm just I'm just thinking like of things that's just gonna make the sound continue to to play. Like what what it's gonna do that. I also don't just want to start dumping printfs in here because there's gonna be so many with how high the sample rate is. Though I could probably print out when the registers change at least. So we can kind of see what we're supposed to be hearing. At least for one of these channels, which I'll probably do that next if I can't figure it out just from this. These durations bit five. For two. Yeah, so this is correct here. Enables bit seven. Duration is the last four bits here. This still seems correct to me. Because the only way you can affect the duration counter here is by setting by writing a new value to the whole register, which is where you'd want to do that, or or just having it tick while use duration is enabled. So if you were to enable or disable the use duration flag, you would also reset the counter here, which would make sense. And then of course this if this is zero here, you would just continue to produce sound for this voice. So that makes sense. So where else is uh, do it looking at a black box here without printf? Yeah, I think I'll do that. I think I'll start printing uh, register values for uh, just for the noise register so we can look at that in isolation. We can try and sort of decipher those. So I think we'll go to where the noise voice is here. And I'm just gonna start printing basically all the rights, I think. And yes, I put 0x here uh, instead of doing pretty printing here. The reason is because I've actually had it have issues with uh, leading zeros if I don't make this separate. So there is a reason for that before community compiler gets on me about that. just to make these aligned because actually I won't do that. Thresh rate T, how's it going? 656, so the noisy, noisy part is, is the sound 05 Milky Way wormhole. Was, was that the case? Let me, I'm just gonna double check. Oh, I close that tab. Yeah, it probably is. 66, and I hear almost no noise channel on the sample on Planet VB. Interesting. FNOS says, seems the duration stuff hasn't been committed to the repo yet, so we can't look over it. Yeah, I'll, I'll do that really quick. Do that really quick. Yeah, there's some tiny changes here to this stuff. Won't comment in the printing. I don't want to isolate the sample for the commit either. All right, that was just some additional logic. I already committed the other stuff. Let's do this too. Just push both. Yes, if you guys want to follow along at, ho at home, that should, uh, that should help. Otherwise, don't worry about it. Um, yeah.
Oops. There we go. So let's just see what happens now. I have a feeling these are actually going to change quite a bit, but it should be fine. Yeah, so here we have volume play control. Basically, everything's turned off for that channel right now. It's actually... Yeah, it's actually really cool to see. <laughs> I thought these would change a lot more often, so that was actually really cool. Here, here we can see it's actually writing to the play control a bunch. I wonder what that's doing, actually. I'm going to cut it off here just to like check it, uh, check out these values. Um, to see if these actually look sensible. So like 4-0 in this case is going to be not enabled. Use duration. It's part of the duration, actually. I mean, here we're not expected to have any noise here, so that's actually fine. But uh, no, so bit four up here is actually going to be this one. It'll be the duration. So it's using duration, but basically everything is disabled. Running volume to left and right. This was a mono sound, so that makes sense. All right, data 5.1. So 5.1 here is going to be, yeah, some duration. And use duration, basically. No, 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 sorry. That's bit 6 being said, isn't it? That's a bit odd. Oh no, sorry, that, that was data. I can read. Where's the... Uh, where's... Here it is. Envelope data. Yes, yeah, so this is a this is a reload value up here, and then down here is the uh, step value. So this would be decreasing from this, which would make sense. Disables for a little while, and then this is some sweeping kind of sound, which should make sense with the frequency shift here. Yeah, frequency high here, and then just does this. As you can see here, looks like it wrapped around, wrote the high value here. That's pretty cool. We're seeing pretty sensible things here. But let me let me get to the thing where now that we've learned to read this a bit. Let's get to the point here where we actually want to take a look at it. You see a little echo thing that happens in there. It's pretty cool. And then it still ticks these, and I'm guessing it's just something in the pattern that, like, disables that sound or something. Okay. So here's where we're getting our static. It looks like it's writing these all the time. So it's writing to the frequency, and then it's writing to the play control. And I also want to check up here. Cause it, okay, so it did, it did write... Like, the data and the noise control here. So in this case, the data, the reload was F0, right? So this actually, uh, is the mask for self-duration correct when writing to play control? I'll check that in a second, because what, what I'm seeing here is that this writes to the envelope data F0, and that's going to be the reload value here, um, with the direction in the step interval saying that it's going to decrease from that. So this, this maybe this was supposed to be like a symbol or something. Um, and then it writes to the envelope and noise control, uh, which should disable the envelope, actually. And then here we have... Okay, that's actually interesting already. You know what I think it is? I think maybe if we disable the envelope, 
that's supposed to set the level to zero. I wonder if that's what that is, because then there would be, then this would just cut off the noise here. I mean, otherwise, otherwise this actually could get to zero though. This was just supposed to be like a noise splash. And this also might've been part from part of the uh, other sounds, but basically quiet. Uh, and then write this frequency. So it's a constant frequency and then the play control for this channel ends up being E1. Which E is the top. It's going to be 8 plus like the top 3 bits set I, I believe. So it sets these bits and then duration. So this is telling it to play. So everyone else says, I was checking for underflows with all the unsigned values, but the code seems fine. Fnote says, uh, the mask is really looking wrong to me. So that was self.duration when writing to play control. Um, that was up here. If this doesn't make sense because the duration would end up being way too long. That might make sense here. So, so okay, so when we write it, we say value and 20 is not zero. Oh, that's use duration. Duration is, oh, hey, totally. That is definitely the wrong mask. Uh, in this case, and that might totally explain that. You're absolutely right. Uh, so let's go ahead and look at what that was. That was, that was the play control again. which that's up here, isn't it? I keep losing where these are here. Yeah, the duration is the lowest, the low four bits. And this totally uses also the upper bits. So that is absolutely wrong. That's a nice catch. Nice catch. Um, so we'll do that. And then this should be fine writing it out. So let's just try that and see if that makes sense. Cause yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. That would have made it really long. And that also can explain some of the other voice breaking that definitely heard earlier. I think that killed it. So now it's like a little, um, little tick for like a little hi-hat or something. And this makes a lot of sense for what we're seeing here because you'll see these come periodically. So that makes sense. FNO says it's below five bits, is it? Bits four through zero. Yep. Again, you're right. Nice catch. Because it's bit four through zero. So this should be one F here. Let's try that again. I bet, by the way, if we look at the volume reg, we can see that panning happen. I just want to see that in that sound effect because that was kind of cool. Yeah, B976, that's it going from left to right. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, so this still sounds about the same because it would have been like twice as long as a tiny blip that was before. This this actually sounds correct, though, because I think there was a little hi-hat here. Let me, let me go to back to Planet VB and pull that song again. We may not even hear it. Um... just because it was pretty quiet. But we should be able to hear it a little bit. Yeah, again, nice catch on that. That was pretty cool. Was it Milky Way Wormhole? Yeah, that sounds right, because that's a little hi-hat click. So let's go ahead and enable the other voices and just see what we get. I'm happy if, if just a bit mask was the issue as well, because the logic seems really correct to me. And it seems correct because it's so simple. Like I don't I don't expect there to be much there. Welcome to 
We can see the hi-hats. I, I really think that's cool. Let's go ahead and check just some other games out and see if we hear anything that's super wrong. Other than the speed, which is still a bit off, it's still... This is pretty good. Oh, come on, Mom, we can read the Matrix. So the other thing is the, the pitches of stuff is, is pretty correct. So that's why that, like, slower voice kind of worries me. But maybe, maybe that would be the timer in that case. Because the timer would fire, like, less often. Could actually make sense. Oh, we're missing the sound there. But I wonder if that's a sweep stuff. Let's, uh, let's try another one. something else <laughs> twitch plays ferris watches games <laughs> says thrasher so true right now though so i still like this panic bomber game i think it's cute and it's actually pretty fun to play on the real hardware despite it being a virtual boy game <laughs> Also, uh, this stuff should just build on like stable Rust if you guys actually want to try this, but it has some crash issues on Mac right now until I replace Rodeo with CPL, and it might be really slow because of the, the text locking, for example, but 
Okay, and I'll fix that up. This is like a pretty basic puzzle game, but I just I just enjoy it for some reason. It's just I just find it fun. I do not mind spending my programming stream playing games. If it's being played in the emulator. That's not cheap, that's just proof of concept. The idea here is you're supposed to basically like stack all these things up and you're supposed to line up like three at a time. And you build up these bombs at the bottom. And if you detonate those bombs, it will fill up on your opponent's screen. Now you'll notice I had an opportunity to do that earlier. But I didn't do it on purpose. And the reason is, the reason why, is because I want to wait as long as possible until I make that happen. Uh, so that I can make it like as much of a problem for my opponent as possible. Otherwise it's just going to fill up like a couple bombs. We want it to. We want it to be very troublesome for our opponent. Like th this will be okay. See how much that filled up. That's because we waited, and that that wins us the round. Server else says it takes a lot of CPU on my Mac. I think that's mostly because of um, because of that locking. Uh, it could also be that it, it still needs to be uh, speed optimized, and I haven't done any speed testing after doing the audio, but I have I have a feeling it's because of that locking. Server else says yeah, clogs one full core core nearly using release definitely, and there is there does still need to be some optimization as well, but I want to get most of the core emulation done before I spend too much time on that. So it did so before sound too. Okay, so that's also interesting. So that just means we need more work there generally. That's one of the things as well that uh, if anyone wants to dig in, I'm happy to. Uh, yeah, I mean the code's there, so I'm happy to accept pull requests for that. Especially now that the emulation logic is getting really close to being mature. Although there's still a couple CPU features missing primarily, but also um, if anyone wants to start debugging that, I would. Um, I would suggest commenting out the drawing routines and seeing if that's the bottleneck first because on all the stuff that I did with profiling, that was never the bottleneck even though it was kind of counterintuitive. It was all the CPU execution, just to give you some hints. Also because the drawing logic is a little bit complex and I don't want that to be optimized unless we have, absolutely have to. Yeah, Survey just says didn't do a profile but quick test, but that's, that's still really valuable and the more people that can actually run this code, the better. So, appreciate that. Yuki Fax says, this is like Tetris mixed with Dr. Mario. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> so you see Bomberman theme in a weird version, lol, nice. Basic Puyo Puyo style. It ends up being a pretty fun game. <laughs> Osmodai regression testing, exactly. It's exactly what we're doing. And it's an important part of emulator development. <laughs> um, I love this Bound High game, by the way. He reminds me of Kirby's Avalanche. Ooh, that didn't sound right. That sounded like the envelopes were wrong on that cat meow. <laughs> we'll have to dig into that. Because it's supposed to just like fade in and out with that pitch. Or at least, at least that's the case. Ah, see, there too. The envelopes I think we're triggering too often. So the idea here is you're supposed to bounce on these little balls and not go through the floor like that or else you have to restart the level. Yeah. I can't read the chat and play this. <laughs> I'm trying, but I cannot. And what's another game that might work? A lot of these games still don't work just because of uh, stuff that I know is not implemented. Also, basically, every any time I run Vertical Force right now, I get upset because it has bugs. <laughs> Actually, it's interesting. Some of these games seem super cool. Yeah, a lot of these are
these are R8 games, and they're super smooth. Like, no one's ever heard of them, though, because they're on Virtual Boy. See how they used to only do half that cycle? Oh, that just bugs me. I have no idea why that is, still. So you see, so they can't imagine playing that without feeling sick in five minutes. Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> Thrashrace T says, are you going to implement support for VR headsets? I'm probably not, but I'm more than willing to accept pull requests if people are interested in doing that. Maybe eventually, but definitely not in the next couple weeks, which is kind of the kind of the timeline that I'm looking at for continuing to work on this project for now. I'll pick it up again in a few months for sure, just for like emulator maturity, but I want to get the core emulation done in the next week or so, which I think is possible. Might still be bugs and stuff in there though when I'm done with that. Yeah, so you see it says in the, yeah, feeling sick in that one that rebounds. I actually don't know how that one is in the real hardware. That's a, that's a game that never was actually released for the system. Um, and the Planet VB guys ended up getting a hold of the source code and building building that ROM. So that's why that's why we have it. And that's publicly available. Um, but yeah, I haven't tried it on the real hardware. Need a flashcard for that. But that was a bit concerning that some of those sounds faded out when I don't think they should have. Yeah, F Note just said we should try to figure out the rest of the info wrongness. I agree. Conveniently, it seemed to happen. So it happens there, because th I think that should just be one solid sound. Uh, Thrasher C, did, do they make a VB flash card? I know some guy was making them for a while. Called the Flash Boy, but I was looking. I was talking with someone about possibly making our own with USB debugging. Probably wouldn't be commercially available, but we'd make it open source at least if you wanted to build your own. Just because I don't want to tear apart a bunch of cartridges and try to sell that. That'd be too much effort. For very little financial gain. <laughs> I'm expecting this part to have some noise stuff. Hear that? Cuckoo, cuckoo, cuckoo. That to me sounds like it's the envelope just like going from high to low really fast and repeating. So I'm wondering if we have... Here's the envelope and noise control here, right? So here, just, just to look at this, like, okay, how often does it write this envelope noise control? Zero one, I'm pretty sure is going to be the, um, oops, did I close the text scroll? I hope I did not. No, I didn't. Okay, good. Um, yeah, so again, this is the envelope noise control. Here. So it's being enabled, and repeat is not turned on. And the data is then 4.9 and 4.1. So our reload value is, is four here, four hex. And then nine here would be the eight bit and the one bit. So that's the direction. So in this case, it's the direction is supposed to go up and then this is supposed to go down, it looks like, for, for this little chunk here. That's, that sounds right, doesn't it? Awesome, I, every time I hear that slightly high-pitched sound with the timber, I get Last Ninja song, fla song flashbacks. It's actually not one that I'm very familiar with. I know it's supposed to be an awesome C64 game, at least, but have not played. <clears throat> and then just some more frequency stuff here. And then here we write the play control... Um, that's the actual play control, not the envelope control there. Just, just want to check what this is doing. Yeah, basically disabling here and then enabling the channel again. It doesn't look like... It doesn't look like the envelope is ever written again here when it starts doing this frequency stuff.
So I, I think my interpretation of this is correct, where we have the reload value of four, and then it's gonna go, it's gonna climb up, where the interval is one here. In this case, eight, which is gonna be bit three. This is gonna climb up, and then it's gonna climb down. But where's the? It sounds like it's it has that repeat flag enabled, which I don't think it does, judging by this value. Because that should just enable it. Strange. For, uh, Ashma Dice says, uh, when you get a chance, Last Ninja 2 Basement Loader, the beginning sounds, uh, the beginning sound, and seriously listen to Last Ninja 2, that mansion as well. Totally need to add that to my list. Yeah, so I still think this interpretation here is correct, but it seemed like Yuki Fax is the sunship in the VB the same as the one in the GBC? No. This one is basically all custom waveforms. <coughs> and it has a couple couple more channels. This one's a little more general purpose. Especially the latter, Last Ninja was a great example of how this was is brilliant. It yeah, definitely gotta check that out. Yeah, so here again, all I'm seeing is it enables the envelope. Gonna fade up, gonna fade down. It doesn't look like, then this isn't written at all after that, except there is some play control stuff here. But maybe this, it looks like that's actually written periodically. Maybe I'm not reading that right. Let me, uh, let me play this again, just kind of look at the output. when that slides in. I don't think that's correct. Okay, that actually looks like it's explicitly setting these values. Like that looked like this actually played it a few times. Let me just let me just look up like a I wonder I wonder if this is in if Planet VB has recordings of this one as well. Maybe I'm just wrong and that is actually how it's supposed to sound. I'm going to double check this. It is possible that I'm wrong about this. And I hope I am. <laughs> Not that. It's going to be... I bet it's this one. Okay, that was different. 656, yeah, that kept me out. I was completely wrong. Hmm. Is that one of these? Yeah, so this fades in and fades out. You know what I'm wondering, though? If that's just like a volume ramp... Where was it? Not 
there. I'm just trying to listen to this. Whoops. Just, just how that swells. I mean. I'm wondering if the registers are actually being written at the wrong times. Yeah, we know that one's wrong. Pretty sure we had this clock correct, at least. Just wondering if that might be it, actually. Let me let me double check these periods here. Based on the info that we had. Because it could it could be that the the ramps are wrong, which might make sense. Scan was the step interval, how long each envelope value will last. And one of this value for the actual duration amount. Again, that was fifteen point three whatever milliseconds, which looks to be about correct here. Um. I wonder though. Do I not reset the counter? No, I do reset the counter here. We have the clock counter reset as well. I also think this is being interpreted correctly. So for example, if this were zero, then we would always wait a tick and do this. So it would be one of one of these periods and then it would uh, do its thing. If this were one, for example, it would actually be two of those periods based on what this is saying. Oops. Add one of this value for the actual duration amount. So if this were one, this would have gone by twice because the first one would have been zero to one, the second one would have been and then one would have been not greater than one, and then it would have been two on the next one. So that would have been two periods. So I think the the this part's correct, as well as this. Maybe it's not correct to restart this counter here. I don't think that would be it, but it might be, since I know those values are touched at least. FNF says is the increment actually in the right place. I'll check that in a sec. I think that'll be the next thing I check. didn't help and it makes sense that this would clear this counter anyway because you would you would have set the yeah step interval here is yes, the increment the and actually in the right place that was here it's basically every time the uh so we know we know that the envelope is enabled and then we take down this counter and then we do the adjust so hmm how long each envelope value will last. And I, I'm interpreting that as each like level will last. And in that case, this would be the correct position. Because whenever, whenever an envelope clock, which is going to be have this period happens, um, then we're going to have our counter that counts up to the step interval, which will determine how long that current value for level will last. 
I think. <laughs> um, and then depending on the data direction, we'll actually adjust the level here. 656 says, uh, when the level is counting up, won't it count up to 15 and never reset back to zero with that mask? Uh, no, this will, as soon as it gets past 15, so when it goes to 16, then this mask will make it zero. So I think that's correct. I think that's correct for a max value of 15. This should make some sense. And then on a transition to the value being zero from either an increment or a decrement. We're going to either reload the level or disable the envelope. 66 says that mask will hold it at 15. I don't think so because if this level were to go to 16, the 16 hex is 0x10. And if you add that with F here, you'll get zero. So I don't think that'll hold it at 15. I think that'll make it wrap when it goes above that. And when it goes below that, so like if it were zero and then it we subtracted one, we'd get negative one, which is all Fs, and that with F when we get 15. So I think that's correct as well. FNL says, I'm thinking the envelope duration might just end up being one too short. We can try to test that if we just do this. My, my gut feeling is that's not what's going on, but I'm more than happy to try it. which points to it still being the duration but I don't think that was still I don't think that was yet correct see because we still get some stepping so I'm wondering if maybe um, maybe the data interval is not maybe the mask for that is wrong because maybe that's not getting to high enough values you know what I mean? Bits two through zero. Which should be seven here, right? If not, says, yeah, I don't think that was it. But it did it did sound closer, so I think it's gotta be something with the duration. Just to be sure, I'll double check my uh, nanoseconds to seconds conversion. I'm just Googling 1S in NS, and we get a 1 with 9 zeros, which is what we have here. So that should be correct. So then dividing it by this many nanoseconds in a second, divided by, in a second, divided by this many periods in a second, as if it's 65.1 hertz. then we'll get this many nanoseconds for the period. So I think that's correct as well. I also don't think it's the duration in this case because it's definitely the volume ramping down. And I think that's still correct.
Very interesting. Studio C, uh, good night. Have fun at work tomorrow. <laughs> Thanks for hanging out. I'm not seeing anything obvious here. But I'm hearing that it's obviously wrong. <laughs> but I also don't think it's the repeat being wrong like I initially thought just because the way it sounded. I may be consulting other docs at the moment. Just to double check this stuff. I mean, I think I think we're really close to having it correct. There's just something something a little off here and I have a feeling it has to do with the envelope duration. Uh, F notes is what what happens if you try adding one to the duration like we do with the envelope. That's worth a shot. I I my gut feeling as well is that this won't be it, but I'm more than happy to give it a shot since we don't particularly know at the moment. Uh, so me. the cat meow. <laughs> yeah, don't think that's it either. Unfortunately. If not, says I'm out of ideas. Me too, a bit at this point. I'm cheating a bit looking at some other documentation, but I'm seeing the same info. So that didn't seem to help much. <laughs> Interesting. Seeing as though it's 10.30, though, I might actually cut off the stream for tonight. Give this a rest. Uh, which might actually be a good idea anyway. Kind of dig around and come back to it later. Um, but if I find out what it is, I'll be really loud about it. And if you guys want to keep looking, feel free. Especially if someone wants to make an issue or a pull request with a fix, that'd be cool. Up to you guys, but I think, yeah, I think I will cut off the stream in a couple minutes just because getting a bit late. I mean, either way, this was really good progress, so I'm really happy with that. Um, oops, gonna fix that duration thing. But I think I think this is the point where sleeping on it might be good for for this anyway.
going to commit this last thing. If you guys have any questions, go ahead and fire them away and I'll answer them before I shut down the stream. By the way, if note, if you want to mention in this commit, uh, just give me your GitHub name if you have one. Just don't need to mention. I'm gonna stick one in here though. <laughs> ah, of course. Keep doing bangs there. Doesn't like it. Oh, F no, I didn't realize you were a free fall on GitHub. I want to give you a mention. Ugh. Sometimes I mess up in Vim because I'm not very good at Vim. Cool. Dr. HT says, uh, questions. Hmm, why is the Earth round? I think that's just how gravity works. <laughs> Marty Cherry, nice stream. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. This this was cool because we made some some good progress. The code was pretty simple, even though we know it's wrong. <laughs> But I think I think uh, giving it a bit of a rest for now is a good idea. Work out the kinks later. I'll probably. Um, I thought I was going to uh, change that um, that audio interface stuff now, but I think I'll probably end up doing that like tomorrow over the weekend. Furry McGee, thanks for the follow. <laughs> Appreciate it. But yeah, so do that over the weekend. I'll probably also dig into this stuff over the weekend. I mean, it'll be just the same process, so I probably probably won't stream that if I dig in. But if I find it, then I'll probably say something about it. Otherwise, we'll talk about it next uh, next Thursday. Um, judging by how the emulator's going, uh, the last couple things other than like bug fixes are this stuff and bit string operations. And at that point, the emulator is basically like should be fully compatible with the commercial library, as far as I know. Um, and the rest should be like bug fixes and small things. So at that point, I want to write up a big thing about how people can, can contribute if they want, like a big, like list of things and what to, what to look for. Um, so people are interested, I can kind of head that up, but then I'll have to kind of switch focus to other projects. So if people want to help out. That'd be great. I definitely wouldn't stand in your way. Um, but we can, we can deal with that next week. And so then I guess the reason I bring that up is next week will probably the last be the last week we work on this simulator for a while. Might pick it up again later, later in the year. Um, but then, so after next week, it's probably going to be in 64 stuff again. So that should be pretty cool. So yeah. Anyway, thanks guys for uh, watching and contributing and helping me debug stuff. That was really cool. It's really fun. I uh, appreciate seeing you guys all again, and uh, I guess I'll see you again next week. So see you later. <laughs> I'm always really awkward with this uh, turning off the stream stuff, but I'm going to turn off the stream now, so I'll see you guys next week.